Welcome to WOSU's virtual booth for COSI Science Festival. I'm Diana Bergeman, one of the producers of the show, and I'll be your host today. Our topic today is the science of storytelling. With us are some of the team members that produce QED with Dr. B, which is our brand new show with Dr. Frederick Bertley, president and CEO of COSI, who's actually with us today. So welcome, Dr. B. Glad to be here. <laughs> and also joining us from COSI is Senior Director of Scientific Content and Research, Dr. Marcy Howdyshell, who helps craft the content for the show. Welcome, Marcy. Thank you. <laughs> so today we'll be talking about how we actually go about making stories for the show. We're happy to answer your questions. So use the question and answer function at the bottom of your screen, and I'll be monitoring those questions. Plus, we'd love to hear your ideas for future shows. So be sure to type in what you'd like us to report on in future episodes. We also have today on our set, Cindy Gaylord, which is the Director of Content for TV. Welcome, Cindy. Thank you, Diana. It's great to be here. So we're gonna start with the basics. Um, what are the five stages of video production and how do we use those in QED with Dr. B? This is what I love to talk about. We never get to talk about it, right? We never get to tell other people, this is how we do stuff, right? So I'm thrilled to be here. And one of the big things is when I talk to students or groups and I say, you have to remember what you're doing to begin with. So are you building a rocket ship or are you creating a novel, right? Both of them have different processes, right? So let's think about that. If you are building a rocket ship, you use a lot of tools, you use a lot of metal, you use rocket fuel. If you're creating a novel, you may use a word processor or um, maybe you just write out your story on you know, longhand. So what we do is, and what, what happens when you're creating an idea from beginning to end is you have to think about what is my process in addition to what is my idea, mm -hmm. right? So our first thing that we really wanna look at is what is the process so we can look at the idea? So our process, let's go to our first slide. Our, f our five stages of video production. Our idea development, that's the first thing. Our second one is pre-production which is what we call, I call our magpie stage. It's gathering everything and putting it into one big basket. Our production is using all of the stuff that we have gathered together and being able to go out and gather a little, a little bit more and a little bit more. And then post-production is where we take our basket right in front of our edit bay and we actually build a show. The other one is distribution and broadcast. A lot of people who do um, YouTube videos the distribution is on YouTube, right? Mm -hmm. Our distribution is two ways. Um, if you want to see our show, uh, it's WOSU.org, QED, uh, slash QED, and we put it on broadcast on Wednesday nights at 7.30, so that's distribution. But we're going to talk a lot about idea, pre-production, uh, and production, and post-production today, which is really what our team, the four of us here, and some other producers that we have, we talk a lot about our process, right? So let's go to the second side. So we, we're talking about idea development. What is it that we're making? Is it a rocket or a novel? But then when you get to decide you're gonna make a show, well, what's the show about? That's science. Well, what, what is the episode about? Well, sometimes it's about artificial intelligence. Sometimes it's about bacteria, right? So you start dialing that down. Why are we making it? That's a big deal. When we all got together, we decided the show that we wanted to, ma to make was going to be about getting people to just talk about science, right? So we're making the big why are we making it about let's talk about science, and the small answer to that is why are we making it about AI or about viruses or bacteria or the science of taste or the science of exercise? Well, all those topics sound amazing. We want to be able to take that to our audience and get the, the um, absolute up-to-date science in those and get Dr. B to talk to the, the scientists that are around the country that are making these really great advances. So idea development takes that into consideration. And then who is our audience? We wanted families to start talking to each other about science. That was it. That's what we want to do. So idea development is not only um, what we're going to say, but who we're going to say it to. No matter what you do, if you're creating an idea, you have to decide who is going to be the audience for that, whether it's your teacher reading you know, a story that you put together about what you did last weekend, 
or it's a science show that we are trying to get seven, eight thousand, nine thousand people per week to watch our show, right? Mm -hmm. So you have to keep those things in mind. So I want to go to Dr. Bertley right now, and I want to talk to you just a little bit about. We've tackled a lot. I just told you about some of the the um, topics we had: viruses, bacteria. You're an immunologist. You've given us so many ideas about that. What are some of, you know, what is your process when you and, and Dr. Uh, Howdy Shell come together? You're the ones tackling what sh we should be talking about, right? So what's that process? What do you want to see? Yeah, well, Cindy, thanks, thanks so much for asking that question. And before I jump into the answer, I just want to really let the audience know that this is a partnership and um, COSI ends up looking phenomenal because of the great work and skill set of WSU. Let me tell you, the stuff you see on at 7.30 on Wednesdays is made amazing by this incredible team. So I just have to recognize that. Secondly, thanks for doing this program during the COSI Science Festival. It's going all week, ends on Saturday. Get us book a little record thing we're going to do. So check that out. All right, with that, on to the show. You know, Cindy, it's such a great question. What myself and, and Dr. Howdy shall work on in terms of thinking of the, how do we think about the topics is two things are fundamental to COSI. One, we know that science is everywhere and for everyone. So we want to make sure we're capturing cutting edge topics. The second thing is we know a lot of people are just turned off to science for whatever reason. And if you think about the average science high school chemist, uh, the, the average science high school science class, and you go in there and you'll see like these old blacktop desk, maybe an old Bunsen burner, maybe a beaker. And that's the concept that most people think about science. And in fact, our kiddos are going through school and experiencing that today. Yet science in the 21st century is at the cutting edge of all these critical disciplines. So myself, Dr. Howdy Shell, we really think about, okay, what are cutting edge relevant topics that are impacting men and women across the planet, across this country, A, and B, which ones do we pick from that, that we can think of how we bring them alive, how we make them engaging, and then how we leverage all of your production skills to really make it accessible to a wide audience. That is awesome. Dr. Howdy Shell, what, what is your process? You actually do a lot of the research. Go find some of these folks that we talk about and talk to. What's your process in doing that? Yeah, I think um, I would say when it comes to coming up with the topics, this for me is the most fun part, right? Because Dr. B and I, we are science enthusiasts. So we know science is everywhere. So there's absolutely no shortage of topics. But it's really a matter of what are we excited about? What do we want to talk about? What is everyone else excited about, right? So that may be just things that we encounter in our everyday lives that we just want to learn more about, right? We want to learn more about the science of taste, what's going on inside your body when you taste something. Um, or it may be something that, you know, I read about in an article or heard about in a TED talk that I want to dig deeper into because I think it's relevant to me. I think it's relevant to everyone around me. So a lot of these, it's just a matter of kind of coming up with a list of topics that I am just really excited about. And then we get together and we kind of all bring our own lists and, and decide on what we think will be the most relevant for our viewers. That is awesome. Your enthusiasm in, in all of the meetings we've always had uh, is contagious. That's why Diana and I get very enthusiastic when we know that we are, are headed into creating and producing these ideas. So let's get into some of the, um, the uh, aspects that make an actual good story. So what we've got so far is a handoff from our COSI team that says, Di Cindy and Diana and your team, we're going to take this theme and these uh, ideas and we're gonna actually produce it. Well, it's up to us to create a story, mm -hmm. right? And that's really where the challenge is. How do we create a story? It's not just an interview, right? right. It's how this progresses, so it's a story. So compelling storytelling, let's go to the slide. Um, there's a few elements that really make a compelling story. Now, the context is we have to find where we start. Everybody understands the best children's stories start with once upon a time, right? Well, we have to figure out where that beginning is and we have to bring our viewer into that beginning. So when we talk about extraterrestrial life, wow, that's a big beginning, right? Or if we talk about nanotechnology, well, that's a very, okay, we're gonna dive deep into the universe, basically a very small construction, right? Cellular construction. So we have to tell our viewer 
this is where we are. Mm -hmm. So we signal what road we're on. So that's the context. Now, the other thing that Diana and I do and our other editors and our videographers, show instead of tell, right? So we don't explain stuff. That would be something we do at school, right? When we put together a television show, we're gonna show you. We're gonna try to get that great graphic. We're gonna get that video. We're gonna get that uh, photograph. So that's what makes a really good video story is to show what's going on. And some of these pictures behind the scenes, you see um, Dr. B out there, we're, we're actually showing it. Um, him in the football field, trying to figure out and explain who, uh, human evolution, right? So we're showing that. And here's the fun part. This is what Diana and I love so much, the personal examples. One of my favorites was um, Dr. Barzilay, who talked about her um, work in artificial intelligence after she was diagnosed with breast cancer and how she could use mammogram technology to help diagnose or predict when breast cancer was coming back. What a great personal example yeah. to show you what the, the uh, possibility of artificial intelligence can be. And here's the other thing. The next thing is what is at stake. You always have to decide and look at and really understand what is the tension here. With Dr. Barzilay, that's easy. We want to make sure that more women have tools at their disposal to make sure that they can be diagnosed with breast cancer early so that they can get their treatment early. Those type of things we always have to uncover and uh, bring to the forefront. And then the last thing is, because we're educational television, because we're um, COSI, we're always gonna educate our audience. That's what makes our television a bit different than anything else. We want to teach our audience something. Right, come away with um, something that is uh, new, interesting. Maybe they learned it in the process of us telling it. Maybe they've learned it from the interview. Maybe they've learned it from Dr. B. But we always have that teachable moment that's fun and interesting. So we wanna make sure that we get all that. I'm gonna go back to Dr. B and Dr. H. These are the personal examples we're gonna give you, that, that um, uh, 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 possibility of you giving us your favorite personal examples of all the stories that we've gone through so far, uh, so, so well. So Dr. Dr. B, what is the, your most favorite story so far that has just really floated your boat? <clears throat> yeah, um, it's, you know, Cindy, such a great question. And, and one, and I love how you framed up and basically just taught us a master course on, on the arc of storytelling. And, and one of the really important things for, for all of us, and particularly us at COSI, is we want to humanize these men and women. A lot of times, this show is about science literacy, this show is about getting people excited about science, but it's also ensuring that the public sees that these are men and women like us. They breathe the same oxygen we breathe, they have two legs, two arms, etc. You know, that they're they're very much like us. And that human story, that connection helps bring that alive. So two that I'll cite, one is we interviewed Dr. George Church. He is an eminent geneticist, one of the best gene experts on the planet, incredible person, big time Harvard professor. Well, he actually failed out of Yale undergrad, right? Like that's an important story that the public needs to hear that no, all scientists aren't straight A students. All scientists aren't necessarily, you know, top of their class. But they're just people who are passionate about pursuing something. <laughs> the man failed out of Yale. Um, yeah, he got into Harvard, of course, and continued his education. But that's just a neat piece that he's willing to share with us. The second real story I want to talk about real quick is, is Dr. Hart, who is um, Dr. Carl Hart, a neuroscientist, neurologist um, in Columbia. And he talked, he, and he works in, in the science of addiction. And he talked about growing up in um, Oakland um, during you know, the crack epidemic, and he saw the communities being ravaged by this massive drug problem. And he said, you know what, I'm going to go through school, I'm going to study, he actually was part of the military as well, came out, continued his studies, so he could help resolve this problem and hopefully ameliorate the tough community and the many communities across this nation that unfortunately are impacted by drugs. So, you know, his personal story led him to be on the cutting edge of helping us better understand addiction. So, Dr. Howdy Show, what is your, some of the, the, the top few that, that you like, the stories that we've done so far? You know, it's so hard to choose, um, but I would say, you know, being a scientist myself, I think so often the only thing we see about, you know, research is being done is just that end result. Maybe we, if we see it at all, right? Maybe we read a news article about what was found. Maybe we read a scientific publication. 
But what we don't always see and hear about is the year or years of effort that was put into, you know, doing that research and gathering all the data for that publication. So we had a fantastic interview with Drs. Ellen and Lonnie Thompson. They are paleoclimatologists, um, outstanding, outstanding work. And obviously their results are so, so important. Um, but what they told us about in the interview is all the trips that they took around the world to, to gather these ice cores, to drill for the ice cores, the people that they met on the trips. And it really struck me when, um, when Lonnie mentioned that, you know, they've been doing this for four decades and some of the ice cores that he has gathered, the glaciers that he gathered them from no longer exist. So all that we have that remains are these ice cores that are being preserved to be studied um, at um, the Bird Polar Research Center. That is amazing. That was a really, really great interview. And we are so happy, I think, in our team to be able to follow along with you um, and be able to tell these stories um, that, that really not only make us think, but just resonate for, for weeks afterwards, right, on the implications of what we could be doing not only better, but more efficiently, right? And I also think that we've talked to our interviewer or our, um, our experts in a way that you said, Dr. Bertley, that, that humanizes them, but also humanizes their science, right? I mean, it's one of those things that, um, that we've learned that it, it's all about the human existence, isn't it? I, I mean, absolutely, you nailed it. Yes, we wanna humanize them, but we wanna make sure that the listener, the viewer, understands that the science is about them too. So I love how you frame that. It's really humanizing that whole scientific enterprise and, and, and making it accessible. You know, deconstructing that wall that the average public has on this kind of field of science. So you nailed it, it's humanizing the scientists, the men and women, but also the science itself. Excellent. So we're going to go into uh, pre-production here in a second because we've just been talking about ideas and I realize it's a really quick march through how we find ideas. We get uh, the football basically to how to tell the ideas. We're going to go into pre-production. We also want to make sure that our audience is available or, or knows that we can answer questions. Do we have any questions so far? Not yet. You can go on the question and answer function at the bottom of the screen and submit your questions on how we tell the story, how we tell science, but also if you have any ideas for future shows. So make sure you submit those because we don't often have Dr. Frederick Bertley here with us or Dr. Marcy Hardeschel who are amazing at science and Cindy who's amazing at storytelling. So tap into their brains if you want. So yes, yeah, so with that being said, yes, the next process from kind of planning that whole content is really taking that into pre-production. It's taking it one step forward towards production. And really what that entails is we've identified the scientists we wanna interview, but now we have to schedule those interviews. So we're emailing, calling, doing anything we can, um, offering them candy, things, whatever we can to get them <laughs> to interview. You no, know, they're, they're amazing. Uh, we also need to coordinate with all of the producers to make sure that we uh, have the visuals we need. You know, what kind of video do we need to grab while we're in the field? Do we need photos from our scientists? What kind of graphics do we need to tell some of the science? Some of the science is very intricate. It's very difficult to show in video. So are there any really great visuals that we can help, you know, show and tell the story? So it's all what Cindy said, it's all about show and tell. And then we also really, as we're you know setting these up, we're really uh, aware of the examples and our and our guests and what they'll offer. So we're really kind of honing in on those personal examples from our guests. And as a team, as we start getting closer to production, we really try to nail down what do we want to teach our audience because these interviews are like an hour long. So we try to kind of focus what is it that exactly we want to talk about that's interesting and new. And this is kind of where we really need help crafting the perfect questions to get what we need. And we rely a lot on Marcy and, and, and Dr. B to do this. So I'm gonna ask you each a question. I'll start with Dr. B is, how do you guys craft your questions around each guest? Yeah, I mean, so, so again, uh, both Marcy and myself um, went to the Cindy School of, of, of Video and we learned real quick, you have to have the, you know, the who, what, when, where, and why. So Cindy, I hope I got that right. Um, and, and so we're, we're really starting with that, right? And, and then 
we want to, you know, once again, we hear literally very, very strong on that storytelling art from our WSU producers. And when we think about questions that can a tee up, what's the question? What are we trying to define? What's the topic? Kind of just define that. And then the next set of questions do two things. One, allow us to get them to talk about the cutting edge aspects of their research, but then two, also allow them to tell the story of why it's relevant to the viewer. And so we frame those questions up in that way um, with the, starting with that formula of who, what, when, where, and why, but then customizing it to the specific content or field of interest. So Dr. Howdy Shell, you do a lot of research though in creating some of these mm -hmm. questions, right? I mean, this is part of the planning process that I want people to understand. So how much research do you do when you've created the, the topic, you've created the um, um, field of study, you've identified the person that we're going to interview, but then you've got a lot of other steps in that, don't you? Absolutely, yeah. So we want to learn as much as we can about the people we're going to interview and about the research they're doing um, and have done in the past. So, you know, we're, we're going online, we're watching talks that they've given, we're looking at their lab page, at their lab's, you know, research page, seeing what sort of research they're doing. Sometimes we stumble upon additional research that they're, that they're doing now that we didn't even know about, this kind of new cutting edge stuff. So we're doing a lot of research into our our interviewers to kind of, or our interviewees to kind of get to the questions that we want to ask them. That's awesome. I think we have a question. We do have a question that actually comes up a little bit with the content development. And this one I'm going to give to Cindy first because <laughs> she <laughs> starts this process. Uh, I have a question. How do you structure the script so that you're talking at a language level that is appropriate for your audience, especially with shows about science? Not everyone has the same knowledge level. Wow, that is an incredibly good <laughs> question. One of that is you do it for a long period of time and figure out, um, um, it, practice makes perfect, all right? So that's one of them. Um, the other is this is a family show, so I am looking for many different things on the, the scripts. One of them is entertainment right? How fun it is. We have Dr. Frederick Bertley, who's one of the most fun scientists I've ever worked with. And a lot of the times we want to build in the fun factor. So we, we build that up. But appropriate language for appropriate um, level is always um, something that takes a long time to master. So I can't give you a glib answer right now. But what I can tell you is what we want to do when we ask the who, what, when, where, and why, it's the why that usually brings in much more of an emotional response, mm -hmm. right? Why do we want to know this? Why, why is this important to me? Why is this important to my family? Why is this important to the future of the planet? When you bring it down to a human level, that who, what, when, where, and why, that's when we feel like we are a lot more connected so um, yes, we can get into you know K through 12 language or you know nine through 12 or all of that, but um, it's more about the the why and why should I feel something about this, right? Mm -hmm. Does that sound? Oh yeah, that yeah. really I think those are the questions that sometimes we have to ask because if we're in an interview, for instance and we have so much to weed through, it really helps us to go back and say, okay, what questions are we trying to answer out of this? What do we really want our audience to know? The other thing we always tell people is, we're not gonna tell all of it in this thing, but what right. is that one thing that we feel would be relevant to the people watching? And is, and is relevant language, just making it accessible, and I think that's what I love about Dr. B says, is we really try to make this accessible for just the person who wants to little, know a little more, we try to stick away from too much scientific jargon. And if we get into it, we try to define it, you know, right. and, and come up with examples. So I think we really do a good job of trying to, to listen to our scientists, but really putting in the content we feel needs to, to be in there. A really good example of that, Dr. B, was when we were talking about who, uh, human evolution and um, how skin color changed over time. Um, and you were really um, very much wanting to make sure that we have the right metaphor, right? So what did we do? Yeah, I mean, we, we, we talked about the, the concept of skin color changing over time um, with the concept of a prism and the, the, the light spectrum where you have red, orange, yellow, green, blue, violet. And none of us on this call, none of us of the 7.8 billion people on the planet can say that, oh, this is where you separate red from you know orange, yellow, green, blue, violet. There's a continuum along the way, right? 
And so when we describe it that way, it's really cool to people for people to understand, okay, race is similar, you know, skin color is similar. There's not an, an exact black or white, but there's all these nuances in between that nature through things like the prism and, and other uh, natural examples have shown us at analogies. And, and I think that's the, the, the real punch that you said there, Cindy, and you alluded to Diana, which is, you know, again, people generally, for whatever reason, can be a little scared of science. When you can come up with an analogy, an actual story or construct that they can relate to, that light bulb goes up. And we talk about the aha moment all the time on QED. Absolutely, and I think that um, what Diana and I have talked about in our meetings is that if we understand the science, we've gotten it to a level that it's an adult can understand it. Because some of this is quite frankly over our heads, even though we're highly educated people. Mm -hmm. If we can talk to you, our science experts, and say, so what is that like? What does that mean? What is a microphage? Mm -hmm. What is that? Um, we can actually get it to a point where we can tell our audience. So we're sort of the litmus test for that. And I think that um, that really helps our viewers as well. And I think that this is a great lead in to actually when we get into production. So that's, yeah, that's our next right. stage. I don't right? want to lose fact. Uh, can we go to the slide that we have up here? I do want to make sure that everyone understands mm -hmm. that <laughs> the way you build a rocket ship and the way you build a, a show are pretty much the same thing. There are a lot of details on there, aren't there, Diana? Oh, yeah. We have to, we have to keep track of of a lot of details. So we have to come up with really good tools to be able to not only organize all our information, but share where we're at in the process of all of this. Some of it we're in pre-production, some of it we're in production, some we're in editing. So really planning and having a good tool that helps everyone be able to share the information in a, in a very relevant but timely manner is, is really important for us. And I think that the one thing that I've always um, felt like with our with any big endeavor is that you have to take time to plan, to plan, right? You have to spend time planning and creating that process, while. Um, so that you can create the production process and that runs smoothly. So we have a lot of planning meetings. We use Google Docs, we use Teams, we use um, email, uh, we use phone calls, we use texts, we use Zooms, all, <laughs> Zooms we use all sorts of stuff to keep communicating and keep planning with each other mm -hmm. and then keeping those, um, those planning processes tidy, right? Uh, to make sure that we don't lose any of those details. Yeah, and I'd say our planning is actually, we spend more time planning than when we actually get into production. It goes pretty quickly, because by that time we know exactly what we want. So production really means recording the content that we've planned. So that's with the interviews that we do with Dr. B and the guests, that's either over Zoom, because we're in a pandemic, so it's been a great way to access people across the country. We also go out into the field. If we can do a one-on-one -on -one interview, we love to do that. We also have to uh, decide, is there any other video that we can capture with the scientist. If they're local, we'd love to go into their labs and show off all their really cool equipment. And so that way when they're, when in their interview, when they're describing it, we're actually showing them using the technology and then it, it, it's, a, it's a great way to connect it. So that's ideally what we love to do. So uh, with that being said, I got a couple questions for everyone. Mm -hmm. So Dr. B, I wanna start with you. So we've had some big names on the show. Uh, we've got we've had some great opportunity to inter interview some top scientists. What is your biggest revelation so far about interviewing other scientists? You know, that's a great question. I think <clears throat> what's happening today in society with the growing science illiteracy, um, the pandemic actually highlighted a lot of that, is um, scientists are realizing that they need to be part of the solution to get people to feel more comfortable and be more engaged around science. And so one of the coolest things about these interviews is the scientists almost to 100% of them interviewed are jumping out their socks, excited to be interviewed, you know, for this. Yes, they publish peer reviewed science articles. Yes, they give symposium talks at these exclusive science conferences to people who have this highfalutin vocabulary like themselves, et cetera, and they travel all around the world doing this. But this show and shows like QED with Dr. B allow them to actually showcase what they're doing to a broader audience. And they're so engaged with the fact that, to be honest, you know, what's really cool about and distinguishing about this show is we've got an amazing production television team, aka WOSU, 
working with a really good science museum that understands how to bring this science without dumbing it down, without embarrassing the audience, but making it, again, using that accessible term, and the scientists love that we have combined to do this. So seeing how excited they are about what we're trying to do at QED is probably my, the thing that makes me happiest about this process. That's great, and it's it's really fun to be on the interviews personally. Sometimes we get to ask our own questions, but um, Dr. H, I've got a question for you now. So you do a lot of the planning of this. So talk about your what you've learned so far about the process of moving it from the planning stage into the production process. Sure. Um, I've learned a lot. Um, one of the things is just, you know, we've kind of touched on this, the amount of time that it takes to do that, right? Um, we've mentioned that these are often hour long interviews that we're condensing down into maybe five or six minutes. And it's so important to us that we do that while keeping the science intact, right? We're making sure that the, you know, the science that these researchers specialize in is still being conveyed and it's being conveyed in the way that they've explained it. So a lot of that just means that we need to sort of dive into their research. We need to understand it so that when we are condensing it, we are staying true to what they're trying to convey. Um, I've also learned two really important things. So one, again, you know, we've touched on this, but the importance of storytelling, because when you're, when you're cutting down, you don't want it to feel like a science lecture, right? We want this to be interesting and compelling. So that's when we're looking for those stories. And even if you don't get all the science behind it, you know enough. And I hope that maybe people will be intrigued by those stories and want to learn more. And then I would say the last thing that I've learned is just it's so important to be flexible. I don't think there's a single episode that, you know, from, you know, our first ideation to the final cut of the episode that it has remained the same, right? Things change. Maybe, you know, an expert wasn't available to do the interview. So that means that we dig a little deeper and find someone else. Um, and then we just kind of change a little bit, um, you know, what is the story that we're telling? And sometimes, and this is the most fun, um, our experts tell us about something we didn't know about before, right? Maybe some research that they've embarked on um, that, that is totally new and cutting edge, and we are so excited about it. And so then we kind of change the storyline because we want to make sure that that gets into the show. And that, I think, is the most fun because we are learning something new. Yeah, I think it's really important in this process to remember it's very fluid because a lot of times we may have ideas going in, but when we get there, the, I, the, the story might change and we really need to go with a story because sometimes it's something different but even better. And really collaboration. All of this, we're very tightly knit. We're always going back and forth. This really is a partnership and a collaboration to make sure we're all on that same page. So even in production, we're still planning and, and communicating. Um, and so now I'm gonna quickly go to, to Cindy. So you've been producing television for a long time. How is producing a science show different than other things you produced? It's, it's uh, everything comes with its own challenge. Um, but the thing I, I want to do is to make sure that we get the science right, right? Um, I was able to get my, um, uh, my minor uh, back in the Pleistocene era when I was going to college um, to get it in mammalogy. So I know a little bit about science. I know just a little bit about science. And what this show has told me is how much I don't know about science and how much I want to get it right. So. I love this collaboration that we can talk to Marcy, talk to talk, uh, Dr. B, um, and say, is this right? Are we doing this correctly? Because in four minutes, like you said, um, Dr. H, is we want to make sure we get the whole thing, but how do we do that with the visuals and with our animations? So we've put together more of an animation package in some of these. We've got an animator um, on tap. Uh, to make sure that we get this right. Because honestly, if, if I can't see it or visualize it, my viewer doesn't either. In history shows, which is what I've done most of my, my life, or, or art shows, I can visualize the art. I can visualize history. I know enough about history. Science, I can't visualize it. So I'm, I really want to make sure that the science is, is there and correct. And the other thing is, we can go to the slide really quickly, is that the other part of this is that we want to make it fun. Right? Mm -hmm. We want to bring in the personality of you, Dr. B, uh, Marcy, who has a, a wonderful outlook on life with, with science. We want to make it light and delightful. And with science, sometimes that's a little bit hard. You know, you have to make sure that we're not talking down to people and that people really understand it and want to know more about science. In this 
day and age, that's really a, a huge challenge for people to want no, to know more about science. And if I can do anything at all with the show, that's what I want, is people to say, wow, that sounds amazing. I'm gonna go on Google, or I'm gonna go look, search for a few websites and dive a little bit deeper. Yeah, I love that idea. We just wanna spark your interest in it, get, get you going, and then you go search for the rest of it and see what you think about the science. And that's what I love about it. I love science, but I didn't get a degree in it. So right. I'm able to now like understand things in different ways. And there's just one thing that sparks, I know like that it's sparking for other people. Um, so so what yeah. is that your challenge? Is that what you, you would think is the, the big challenge for you in creating one of these shows? No, no, no. My biggest challenge actually, because I do a lot of the pre-production, is coordinating schedules because <laughs> there's a lot of coordination. There's a lot of moving parts and pieces. Everything's in different stages. You know, I'm coordinating 12 different people's schedules and you know we're not only coordinating Dr. B's schedule but our schedules and our scientists and right now we're in a pandemic and so these scientists are actually on the you know are, they're on the front edge of of discovering things and trying to figure out what's going on so when we actually get them and our worlds come together and we can find that one to two hours that we actually can interview them it's so worth it because the science they offer and the excitement and I think what we can teach our audience is just so worth all of the moving parts, so. Absolutely, I wanna quickly go into post-production, so let's go to the slide. Um, if you work and post anything on YouTube, if you're, you're editing and, or recording and editing on your, cam on your phone, um, you're gonna see a lot of very familiar uh, images here. This is Diana in her, her um, home office working <laughs> on one of our shows. And go to the next uh, slide if you don't mind. We work in nonlinear editing and what the difference between a consumer and, and editing system and our editing system is that it's lighter, faster, stronger, and we can do tons and tons of layers. So every little block that you see there on the right hand side is a layer of video and the waveform monitor uh, corresponds to the audio. So we have multiple, multiple layers. And we have the machine that can handle that. That's my edit bay on the, the left there. Um, and we, we just crank these out. Again, like you said, Diana, when we get all of the planning done mm -hmm. and we have all of the ideas, we've done all the pre-production, we've done all the production and gathering everything, this particular process is a little bit more straightforward, isn't it? Yes, definitely. Yeah, it's not too <laughs> bad. So um, with that in mind, what we have just a few minutes left. Do we have any uh, We do questions? have a few questions. So uh, we have a couple questions, but then we also have uh, an idea. Awesome. So um, for a show. So uh, this one comes from someone anonymous, but thinking about some of the past COSI STEM stars and the variety of incredible work in ways that science is everywhere, could there be more opportunities for Dr. B to interview these local STEM stars and get inspired by their work for show topics? Dr. B, that's for you. Sure, um, for whoever wrote that, I know is anonymous, but that's a great question and thank you for that. Just a little background for the rest of the viewers. Um, what they're talking about is we've launched this thing called the COSI Science Festival um, three years ago and you know we put on a bunch of events all throughout the county and contiguous counties actually. Um, one of the things we wanted to do was get the world, if you will, to understand that scientists, again, come in all shapes and sizes. And they're amazing men and women that aren't quote unquote labeled scientists working in Battelle or OSU labs or Princeton or Harvard or what have you, but they're doing other stuff that's actually science, but they're quote unquote regular people. So we came up with this idea called the STEM star, recognizing and celebrating ordinary people doing extraordinary things in the name of STEM. And so we've done this for three years and they're incredible people. I'll give you one example. A husband and wife team from, from um, Bexley have came up with this special cue collar that is a way to protect kids playing football from getting concussions, measuring impact, et cetera. But they didn't work at Battelle Lab. They're not a scientist from OSU. They're just really concerned parents who got together to do this. And so the question, which I love is, how can we on QED with Dr. B as we do these interviews, go and possibly interview some of these folks, quote, quote unquote, along with, or instead of the basic scientists or researcher in the lab. And the short answer is we have talked about that. We've actually talked about interviewing 
quote unquote, ordinary citizens who are doing extraordinary things in the name of science, technology, engineering, and math. And so we don't have that ready for season one, but that, that is on the floor so far for season two as a possible topic. So thank you so much. And it's really, again, it's a great way of getting everybody to understand that there's so many people that are scientists and engineers, but just aren't typically called that. I love that. I love that. Well, okay, I'm going to put it down for season two. So, <laughs> all right, I have another question. This is probably directed towards Cindy is how and where do you find funding to produce and deliver these programs? That is such a great question. Uh, we have a funding team here at WOSU. And um, we, because of this partnership, this unique and one of a kind partnership, COSI and WOSU Public Media are coming together in those teams. And um, we are approaching major corporations within uh, Ohio. Uh, to to do that. Um, so we have a whole funding team that, that does that. Um, what we do as content generators and storytellers is make sure that the major funders know what they're getting, right? So we show them the content. We talk with them with Dr. B in the room uh, to make sure that they understand what they are funding. Um, so yeah, it's, it takes a whole, whole two organizations to bring this show to life. Yeah, it's a lot of work, but hey, it's worth it, right? Yeah. <laughs> so quickly, we have a couple minutes, but I really wanted to get, we have one story idea, and then I wanted to quickly ask you guys a, a couple more questions. I'd love to see a story from Stone Lab on Lake Erie. They're doing some cool stuff in snake conservation and water quality, and I think they'd make for a great segment. Uh, what do you have to say about that, Dr. B and Dr. H? Do you want me to jump in, yeah. Dr. H? <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll jump in first. So, so first of all, thanks for that question. One of the really cool things, obviously, that we can do with this kind of show that's got national and even international appeal is highlight the great gems in this great city. One of them, of course, is the Ohio State University. And so, you know, you heard Dr. H talk about the, 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 the Thompsons as a couple who are, you know, leading the board polar, the bird polar institute. Well, that's an OSU institution. We also worked with the School of Veterinary and Science at OSU. We worked with this College of Engineering at OSU. And so this idea that you brought up or that the reader or, or guest brought up is another great way of showcasing another incredible OSU resource that really digs into a combination of zoology and natural biology. And so, yeah, you know, featuring the stone labs would be another cool thing. Um, and certainly at least featuring one of the scientists from that space would be great. So I love that suggestion. Thank you very much. Dr. H? I'll just add to that, that I already have it written down on my list. So thank you for the recommendation. I mentioned before, the, the easiest part is for us to come up with topics because there are so many great topics, so many great people that we can interview. Um, and, and so yeah, keep sending those recommendations in because we will keep that list going. And, and with that, you know, with our remaining time, what are some shows you wanna do in the next coming season? What are, what's at the top of your list? Well, I see you go first and then I'll, I'll bring it home. Okay, next season, hold on. Um, we have a, a, a big long list for next season, like far more topics than we have the possibility for episodes. Um, I think some of the things that I'm excited about that we've talked about um, are the, the science of sports. Um, so, and, and there are so many different directions we can go with that. So this season we're doing the science of exercise, but totally different going into the science of sports. Um, we've talked about the science of time, which again, we can go in so many different directions for that. And then another one that I'm really excited about is um, the science of going to space. Right. What sorts of training do you have to go through, say, to become an astronaut? So those are a couple of things that we want to talk about next season. OK, really quick before we go to Dr. B, you've got about 30 seconds. So go. <laughs> so real quick. Um, so along those lines, also statistics, right? I mean, statistics and the science of gambling and all that cool number math stuff. People are afraid of math, but statistics governs almost everything we do from your banking to the subprime crisis to understanding a baseball game. Um, but then my favorite is quantum computing. Right now, the computers that we all depend on in your pocket, on your desktop, they're all ones and zeros. It's a binary system. There's a new wave of computer technology called quantum computing that's going to change our lives forever. I can't wait for that episode. Well, and this is a great way to end it. I love hearing these, these stories that you want to do because we can't wait to produce them. We, we make a great team. And so I hope that you've enjoyed the science of storytelling. Thank you to our guests today, Dr. B and Dr. H. 
and Cindy Gaylord here at WSDU. Remember to watch QED with Dr. B Wednesday nights at 7.30, and you can watch all of our episodes at wosu.org slash QED, plus catch us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Thanks for watching, and we hope you have a wonderful science-filled day.